And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. Hello. Hello. And we're back. Um, welcome, folks. Hey, Morris, how are you? I am much better than I was last time we recorded. Uh, you sound better. You sound you. Um, like you're like you're not as close to death <laughs> as you were last time. Yep. Feeling better. Uh, howdy, everybody. Welcome to Dream Idiots. Welcome back, folks. Yeah, thanks for listening and subscribing and doing all those good things for us. Um, you know, check us out online um, at Dream Idiots on Instagram, at Dream Idiots on Facebook, and like and subscribe. And um, you can actually um, give us a nice five star rating on on any platform you're listening on. We're on Apple and Google and iHeartRadio and Spotify. So wherever you're listening, please rate and subscribe. Yes, indeedly. And Brian, you are going first this week, correct? I am indeed. Um, so here in a bit, I have uh, a couple of little story updates before we transition. But first, I'm going to talk about uh, something called third man syndrome. So uh, my question for you is, when you were a kid, did you have uh, an imaginary friend? I, yes, I still do, actually. Um, no, yes, yes, I did have an imaginary <laughs> friend. He was a little boy who looked just like me. Okay. That's how I imagined him. So, right. Okay. So, um, imaginary friends are, um, are an example of, of what's called, um, bicameral mentality. And so in psychology, I mean, bicameral mentality apparently comes from this notion in psychology and neuroscience that makes the argument that once upon a time, um, early human beings, we, we operated in this state where sort of cognitive functions were divided between sort of the speaking side of your of, of one's person and the, part the, and the part of your persona that listens and obeys. And so as we evolved, apparently that division, um, you know, started to erode and that's where we became, we, we, we consciousness and, you know, the ability to be sentient sort of erose, arose out of that. And so um, imaginary friends are sort of kind of tied to this notion of bicameral mentalities. And I mean, it seems as though folks that had imaginary friends, um, you know, the root cause of that can be perfectly natural, perfectly normal. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty common with, with kids, I guess, up to the age of about, of about four. It's, you know, sometimes it's definitely tied to trauma, but it also is sometimes is also just driven by, kids who have a more sort of isolated existence or who are incredibly bright and just need more stimulation. So there are all kinds of uh, root causes that, uh, that are there that are not necessarily you know, negative or traumatic, um, but also tied to this notion of imaginary friends is this idea of what's called third man factor or the third man syndrome. So this um, is inspired by a book, which I have, you know, I've not read the whole thing, but it is incredibly interesting. 2009 book by a guy named um, John Geiger called The Third Man Factor. And it documents all these examples of figures from history, sort of adventurers and explorers who, when faced with uh, trauma, basically, are suddenly experience this very visceral, real third or sometimes fourth or sometimes second presence of, of this person that is there to provide comfort or support during this sort of, you know, peculiar or um, traumatic, but sometimes mundane experience. So one of the earliest um, examples of this is uh, Ernest Shackle Shackleton um, had a book in, in 1919 called South, where he's talking about his experiences um, at the South Pole. Uh, and so uh, you may have seen just recently that they, that they found um, his, um, his boat, the Endurance, you know, mm -hmm. sunk. Uh, and when that happened, he and two other, two other explorers uh, managed to get, get back out onto the ice and they had to hoof it back to um, a whaling station, I believe, for rescue. And Shackleton wrote uh, in his book, quote, during that long and racked march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. So 
his admission at the time was was kind of peculiar because this is this is a certainly a time when you would have been deemed completely insane if you acknowledged any of this but the fact that someone with his prominence and name recognition would acknowledge this sort of made it a little bit more acceptable then the other two guys that were with him during the experience said the exact same thing all three of them were convinced that they were a party to four while they were out there on on the ice so it's certainly uh, a peculiar but a you know i guess a repeatable uh, experience that, that others have um reinhold messner who's the guy who um he summoned everest multiple times he was i think he was the one that went up everest the first time completely on his own and then he went up um the uh he was the first to summit everest without um oxygen um he was kind of having this experience on several occasions uh, Peter Hillary, uh, Edmund Hillary's son, mm -hmm. I believe, had this had this several times as well. And then there's a guy named Frank Smythe, who um, he Frank Smythe actually would have been the man who was the first to summit uh, Everest on, on, on one trip up. He failed to reach the summit by um, a thousand feet. But oh. he but he recounted after the fact at one point while, while he was on this ascent, he reached into his pocket pulled out a slab of a Kendall mint cake. He broke it in half and turned around to give it to the, to the, uh, the other half to uh, his companion, but there was no one there. The, the sense of having someone with him, walking with him, climbing with him was so palpable that, well, obviously I have to give him some of my food. Super bizarre, but you know, incredibly interesting. He said, quote, all the time I was climbing alone, I had the strong feeling that I was accompanied by a second person. The feeling was so strong that it completely eliminated all loneliness I might otherwise have felt. Hmm. So kind of kind of weird, kind of bizarre, but but you know, in many respects, I think sort of cool. The largest group of folks that experience this are are folks that climb. The folks are at uh, at high elevation. But it's also experienced by shipwreck survivors, you know, folks that do those crazy, crazy things where they want to sail from, you know, San Diego to whatever, Melbourne uh, by themselves. They, all, folks like that often experience this as, as well. Uh, and then polar explorers um, experience it sort of less often than folks that are, you know, the high elevation climbers. So when you look up, do research on this, some journalists, you know, call this guardian angel syndrome or the thing you know, they, you know, they talk about imaginary friends um and it's clear that it is your body's you know some type of a coping mechanism i'm not a religious person i'm sure there are a lot of religious folks out there who would happily try to define this in religious terms um you know so guardian angel or that's god walking with you or whatever <laughs> I, I mean i i insist on on i live too much in the in the logical um Logical and I, world, I so. look back, I look back, Brian, and there was just one set of footprints. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. I, I wasn't going to use that as a, <laughs> as, as an example. So, um, so the, um, but you know, it, it is this cultivated inner character that, that, you know, whatever it is, this other side of your personality that then sort of manifests itself in what feels like a very real and palpable way that is there to provide, support and sort of clarity um some folks that have researched in this postulate that okay so extreme cold is is must be the cause your body is reacting to being uh at you know negative 20 degrees you know charles Lindbergh apparently when he when he um went over the atlantic uh you know had had a co-pilot apparently which he spoke to the entire time well he was obviously on <laughs> on the spirit of st louis by himself uh, there are apparently, I've, I've read one synopsis of this, but there are multiple, I think, stories of folks that were in the World Trade Center on 9-11 who were trapped on, you know, whatever floor they were trapped on, uh, choking on smoke, unable to find their way out, and then someone guides them out. So, you know, you know hey, you, come, you know, follow me, come this way, and guides them out of the building. Uh, and then, you know, and then they emerge safely out and then the person, whatever that, whatever, whatever it was, that sense of, that, you know, that they uh, were, were with someone vanishes that the apparition dematerializes just as fast as, as it appeared. Um, others guess that it is tied to diet. So if you're at, you know, if you're in extremes, you know, you're at whatever it is, 25,000 feet, 27,000 feet, 
claiming you're going through who knows how many calories, eight or 10,000 calories a you day. You go into starvation mode quicker. Right. right. So, yes. Yeah. So, so you, you know, you can't eat enough, enough calories fast enough. Um, your glucose levels are, are at the floor. You know, maybe that's what causes the, you know, these operations to just appear. But again, there's, there's nothing consistent about it. There are folks that are in, they're hot, they're in cold, they're at sea level that are at uh, elevation and it still does consent. That does seem to, you know, happen pretty much regardless. The, um, uh, Adventure Journal magazine uh, is quoted as saying, it may just it may just be the oxymoronic combination of boredom and alertness that is enough to summon these ghosts. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's I just love that quote. It's, it's being the fireman. It's the, the, you know, if you're on, if you're Shackleton and you're out on pack ice with two other people, you're, you know, the clarity of thought you must have that you're, okay, my life is, you know, is in peril, but all I see is white. Uh, all I can do is trudge. And so there's no, there's no physical immediacy or alarm. And so the, you know, the, again, the oxymoronic combination of boredom and alertness, I just, I love the way that was sort of phrased. Um, so there's no, doesn't really seem to be much clarity about what causes this. There are some scientists in um, Switzerland. I, um, there's a guy named Olaf Blanke um, and his colleagues are running some laboratory tests to figure out if they can sort of replicate this uh, experience. So they, they developed a device that they take healthy humans and they basically sit them in a chair. And what happens is there's basically, I judge there's some sort of um, a tablet or something in front of them. And that allows the, the, the test subject to draw a pattern. Say, you know, take your index finger and you draw a figure eight. Um, after there's a bit of a time delay, that exact same shape with exact same pressure is then um, basically mirrored on that person's back just as they put it in. But there's a delay of several seconds. The disconnect between sort of the body position and the sense of them being touched, even though they, even though they know it's coming, that sense is so powerful and so eerie that it gives the impression that someone else did it. So, so test subjects feel Holy like there's a shit. <laughs> t- test, test subjects feel like there's a ghost in the room, uh, and for some of the folks that were tested on, they basically they refused mm-hmm. to keep going because it freaked them out so badly. But you know, th- th- this is one test where they where they figured out how to sort of bridge this gap between the uh, you know the the giving and the receiving of, of that of that sensation, uh, and they get you know goosebumps and freaked out. And go, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. And they, <laughs> And then they get up and leave. So I just thought that was sort of sort of fascinating that there is this sort of um, I don't know way to replicate it. Um, so Shackleton's account um, in his book from 1919 uh, that was the inspiration of for um, for T. S. Eliot. There's a, a poet by poem by T. S. Eliot that is called The Wasteland, mm-hmm. uh, and it was basically the um, Shackleton's account. Uh, is part of the inspiration. Um, Elliot turns Shackleton's fourth person into a third, and that's where the you know the phenomenon gets its name, and that's what caused you know the book to get its name. But Elliot wrote, "Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there's only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there's always another one walking beside you, gliding wrapped in brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you?" Wow. So I don't know. It's uh, I stumbled across this phenomenon uh, when I'm watching something on, on TV and then started doing some reading into it. Very, very interesting. You know what the body can sort of do for itself uh, in order to provide, you know, a coping mechanism or solace or you know, whatever you want to call it. But the fact that he, you know, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, would, would be out on pack ice and that all three of them would have this undeniable sense of someone else there with them, I think is kind of eerie and creepy, but mostly really cool. And then they went to a restaurant and they said table for six. Um, <laughs> right. So so I, I'm hearing a couple of things out of this is that one, stress seems to be a certain factor in this. Stress of right. some type, mm-hmm. Right isolation of some type because if you've ever been on a long hike or you used to ride bikes a lot 
you may be in a group of people, but you're still cognitively alone. Correct. Exactly. Yes. Right. You could, you could be on a long hike and it's like, you're inside your own head. Um, I'm just having, I'm having a lot of like, um, flashbacks to like when I was mowing lawns for a living and you had to mow huge lawns with a push mower and it's the same repetitive process. <laughs> right. 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 Brain, and then, brain, brain wanders. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking of like, um, in my mind, the way you've described it, it's clearly some kind of coping mechanism, defense mechanism in popular culture. For example, Tom Hanks and Castaway has Wilson that he has embodied in the right. volleyball. Yeah. Right. Um, but I'm also wondering if there's a certain element to this that we see in cultures where people speak to the dead, right? Oh. Um, where they're really speaking to themselves, right? And, and it's, it's, it doesn't matter what, if that is particularly true or not, it is serving the same function. It's right. for example, it's like when, when, you, when scientists would encounter, explorers would encounter certain tribes and stuff and, and they would know not to drink certain water and the, the scientists would say yes because there's bad microbes in it mm -hmm. and the, the tribe would say no there's little demons that live in the water <laughs> right, that, that's right. why you get sick it doesn't matter because both can be true in, in from the sense of what their their perspective right. and their conclusion is the same don't drink the water right so <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if there's a sense of community that's lacking in this caused by stress and cognitive isolation that's the the common thread maybe despite because my first thought was oxygen deprivation right when you're up right. at high altitudes but then you mentioned the other guys who were at sea or at sea level um that's some fascinating i have never heard of this i've never yeah, heard it, of the third man syndrome it, it, and, and there's i mean there's an interesting combination of um, it's peril, but it's not peril like someone that is attacking you or peril like you are, you've just slammed on your brakes and you're skidding into the car in front of you. It's, it's, you know, it's long-term, it's extended peril. And so there's mm, you know, right, a level right, right. Of, of, of heightened awareness, heightened sensory overload, maybe on, you know, on, on, in terms of assessing and measuring risk, maybe. But if you're, I mean, if you're, if, you know, if you decide, okay, I'm going to get, I'm in, I'm in Honolulu, I'm going to sail to Cape Town and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, white line it, you know, I'm going to see nothing but, but blue for the next X number of weeks or months. Um, what, what, how does your brain adjust shift gears in order to, you know, account for that when you, you know, you, you know your visual senses obviously are not, are, we'll, we'll be taking in much less detail, but you know, what, what will your, what will your brain create for you in order to make you survive? So I don't know. It's, it's it, interesting. It is. And it would be also just to, as another comparison piece, it would be interesting to, if they could do this as a study to see if long haul truckers have a similar phenomenon occur to them, if they're doing the same routes, the same, right. um, well, the, like the, 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 that, that's why I mentioned the white line syndrome. I mean, you know, right, you're, right. That, that's what <laughs> right, made me think right, of it. Yeah. Right, right. And it's like driving across West Texas. And I remember having to drive like my wife and kids and I, when my kids were very young, we had to go over one of the passes here in the middle of winter because somebody had spilled toxic cargo in the Eisenhower tunnel. So we're oh, having God. to drive over. I think it was Loveland Pass uh -huh. in a snowstorm. <laughs> Talk about extended Right. I mean, it took us a long time to get over that pass. And the whole time I'm thinking my kids are in the car, my wife's in the car. What are we doing up here on the top of a mountain? And then I look and the truck in front of me is like Texas. I'm like, oh, great. I'm following a Texan in a white truck in a snowstorm. This is not, <laughs> this is not going to end well. Oh, right. And, and it was, and it was mm -hmm. extended, but you know, it was, we ended up getting off just fine, obviously, but um, that interior dialogue I was having while I was driving, um, I wonder if that's example of this. This is I've wow. Yeah, can, could well be. I mean, I, I, um, it's interesting uh, because I, I like hiking certainly, and and uh, while I don't do it as much as I used to, I do like hiking by myself. And so part of me wonders if there is a little bit of a and I, and I, I did I like cycling by myself as well. If there is, if you're tapping into a portion of your psyche or something that is giving you endorphins or something i don't know 
uh, it's it's interesting to figure you know to see I, i'd be curious to know guys like hillary or or messner if there's something in their makeup or their chemistry that causes them to seek that type of stimulation versus guys that are just men and women that are just adrenaline junkies who you know parachute or you know do do shit like that which is the exact opposite um so i don't know or certainly with like i'll have to ask my uh brother-in-law and sister-in-law hey mark hey veronica who do the <laughs> uh mar- they, they run marathons right and yeah same I'm, same thing mark mark will run like he entered a race that was 24 hours straight of running Oh, one of the ultra mar- Oh, geez. Yeah. Mark, yes. He'll, Mark, he'll if you're listening, this. you're, you're a nut job. <laughs> and he, he, you know, they'll do the, the, they'll do the standard marathons. I don't know how many they've run, but I wonder if they get into it. I'm going to have to ask him and he does listen. So I'll have to, uh, right, okay. Mark, when you hear this, um, get in touch and, and let me know if, if you were talking to Mark too, when you're, um, running or Veronica, <laughs> if you're talking to Veronica too, let, let me know. Wow. Good stuff. So Thank anyway. you, sir. That was yeah. a good one. That was that was. Uh, of course, that 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 comment implies that sometimes you don't have good ones, but that one is was particularly. Um, I, I didn't mean that. You all yours are always great, but this one has a particular resonance, I guess, because of like, I had to do that long, you know, sixteen hour car rot car trip by myself. Where, mm-hmm. wow, I'm gonna have to think about this for a while. Uh, I'll consult with myself and see what happens. That's... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. S- schedule the call, you know, with, you know, Morris Jr. And you can, you know, chat about it, but yeah, <laughs> uh, J- John G. Geiger, um, the third man factor uh, is a book I have. I've, I've, I've read, uh, I just kind of bounced around a little bit. So I've read maybe half of it. Um, Cause it's mostly, it's just laden with stories where this happened. And, <laughs> That's great. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely pretty interesting, compelling stuff. So um, I had a couple things. I was going to give a couple super fast updates only because um, a, one listener encouraged me to do so um, quickly. South Carolina attorney and well-known piece of shit, Alex Murdoch. You, already, you, you heard this news, I know. I think we talked about it offline. Oh, yeah, he, uh, he was found guilty, right? Well, no, he, he was finally uh, indicted or charged, on, murder, rather, on yeah. you know, charged in the, the you know, deaths of his wife and uh, his son. And um, so this is, I mean, again, the, the only reason I mentioned this and because the only reason these stories kind of, I don't know, interest me is, again, full disclaimer, we are not a true crime podcast. Not um, a true crime podcast. <laughs> right. Um, but... This guy, you know, wealthy, prominent attorney. He's a white guy. His wife and his son are murdered. It turned, you know, when I last mentioned this a few weeks ago, it, it, it had just been revealed that there was video surveillance or something. Turns out there is apparently cell phone video where he is not seen, but his voice is heard and it is immediately prior to them being shot. And also when police were there the night these two were killed, Murdoch has blood on him somehow he is not arrested and he's not even charged with this until a year later. Um, white people, and when you say white people get away with murder, that literally is the case. Um, the other example of this, which is part of another story we, we covered, I covered is, uh, Caitlin Armstrong, you know, she Woo-hoo. killed, killed that cyclist, um, was brought in for questioning, then let go. Then she we went on the run and, and, and has now been caught the uh i saw online somewhere i read i actually read a portion of the police report because of a stupid love triangle and you know if if someone is if if you're dating someone and they're texting with someone and hiding that person's phone number in their phone under their massage therapist or their dentist so they can communicate with that person date someone else stop shooting people this woman went into this (laughs) went into this other cyclist's house uh and apparently didn't say a word drew a gun shot her once in the head she went down it it says it says in the police report that uh, mariah wilson was laying supine on the bathroom floor because because someone at apd had to use a five dollar word instead of saying laying on her back she was laying supine but then um shot her again in the head and shot her once in the chest and they know that because they found um the, the bullet that went through her chest they found on the floor beneath her and it had broken the tile beneath her so oh this one was, this woman was was shot three times didn't say two words to her just killed her um again cute little white girl brought in for questioning released 
And of course, now she's, you know, she'll be a guest. She'll be a guest. She'll be at Camp Texas for the rest of her life out in Huntsville, I guess. So counter that with, uh, I, I'm spacing on, on the young man's dang, which is, which is bad of me. There's a, another police case where a young black man was shot. They, police discharged, I think, 60 or 62 bullets at some this, this teenager. And he was hit 46 times for holding, he was holding a, you know, a bottle of Pepsi, whatever the fuck it was. Right. Um, so, um, does in, institutional racism exist? Oh, geez. Yeah. Let's science, ask Kyle, science let's point. Ask, yes. <laughs> let's, let's ask Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> Hobbies include murder. Right. Uh, so, um, so anyway, you know, Google Caitlin Armstrong point and laugh with this su- stupid bitch. And then Alex, <laughs> the same thing. Um, you know, worthless people who, who thought they are, you know, they got caught, but again, police just take your sweet ass time because they're, you know, they're wealthy and white. Mm. Drives me cr- fucking crazy. Good times. Anyway. Okay. So last thing, last thing for you that I have before we shift gears. It's time for the dream idiots curse word of the week. The curse word of the week this week is, and I, I'm not going to have me and Alice read it to you this time. Uh, the curse word of the week is clat fart. C L A T F A R T. Clat fart. German? No. Oh, Dutch? Nine. No. <laughs> uh, Irish? I have no idea. That's clat fart. Clat, clat fart. Um, it, is, it is now, officially now, according to Miriam Webster, it is both a verb and a noun. Uh, it's a gossip to gossip, to tittle tattle, to chattel idly or pointlessly, um, and to discreet, to speak indiscreetly. Um, so if you are, if you are a, a gossip, you're a clat fart or you enjoy clat farting. Uh, and the origin for clat fart was, uh, would I, I saw that and I thought this has to be, you know, whatever earliest, early 21st century. Uh, it was clat fart was, was, a coined by dh lawrence oh my goodness so lady chatter chatterley's lover and clatfart lady lady clatfartley's lover and <laughs> so there you go uh, brian that you've you've hit me twice in one episode of uh, third man syndrome and clatfarting i now could you actually be clatfarting with your other when you're hiking just gossiping back and forth with yourself <laughs> there you go <laughs> third it's, man we farting call, wait <laughs> we call we call that auto clad farting it's, uh, all right Thank lowering you, the bar it's lowering the bar every week <laughs> on dream idiots <laughs> you guys always manage to work farting into the episode <laughs> uh, I, I, I have several other curse words coming that have the word fart in them so <laughs> you got to space those out um so let's let's change let's go ahead and change gears here, and I want to talk to you. And this might be the first. Uh, I've got two others that are kind of similar to this, on the concept of futurism. And what I'd like to start off with, Brian, is growing up in the age of nuclear fear. What do you remember, being a kid, in the threat of nuclear war in the 1980s? Do you have any specific memories of that? Uh, I do. Dim. I mean, I recall being forced to watch uh the day after yep um i do dimly recall having we you know like once a year or twice a year there'd be you know the fire you know exercise i, I want to mm-hmm. say at least once there was the the nuclear bomb exercise where you got where you got under your desk etc but Duck that's cover I mean, drill yeah yeah, yeah but that, i was only two or three times Mm-hmm. 70s only i mean by middle school I don't, I don't i don't think we did that in middle school nope nope i remember it specifically in elementary school and and like you i was shaped by the day after after having to watch that telefilm and being scared witless by it right, right. Um, there's also a film called testament which is about the same kind of mm-hmm. thing surviving in the i'd forgotten until i started doing research for this and strangely enough the movie war games which i've which i rewatched the last mm-hmm. couple months uh war games but we kind of grew up in this idea of mad right mutually assured destruction right that that was an idea that if nuclear war started of any kind it was all over but our drills that we took would indicate 
no, right? That you could survive a nuclear war by taking certain steps. Well, yeah, and, you know, half, half inch of plywood would save you, right? <laughs> right. And you can make an argument that the duck and cover drills were there to keep kids busy, give them something to do in the time zone of emergency. But I would like to talk to you today about a fellow by the name of Herman Kahn. You ever heard the name? Name rings a bell, but not placing it. Okay. He is the love child of Herman Munster and Ricardo Montalban. <laughs> and Madeline um, Kahn. <laughs> yeah, and Madeline Kahn. No, Herman Kahn spelled K-A-H-N, just like Madeline Kahn, I believe. Oh. He was born in 1922, passed away in 1983. And I think that Herman Kahn might be perhaps the single most influential public intellectual in regards to shaping nuclear policy for the United States. He referred to himself, at the time he's well known, but now he's, people don't talk about him much. He referred to himself once as one of the 10 most famous obscure Americans, <laughs> which kind of gets to the point of his humor. He held a position with the Rand Institute or the Rand Corporation rather from 1948 to 1961. And of course we know the Rand Corporation to be a public policy think tank. Um, where this idea that that certain dollars go into this think tank where people sit and think about big ideas, like, for example, nuclear war. He left the Rand Corporation in 1961 and formed his own institute called the Hudson Institute back east. Rand Corporation was California. He went back east to where he was from and formed the Hudson Institute, which is now known as a conservative think tank. They count among their luminaries today, Scooter Libby, just to give you a sense of where they are today. <sighs> but in 1961, on the last day of a congressional session, Kahn's personal testimony, he was called up by one of the senators, and he helped pass a bill that established the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, the ACDA. Okay. okay? The Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Uh, another futurist and probably subject of your future, future episode for this show, Freeman Dyson said that Kahn argued for the ACDA in language conservative senators could understand. And that's not a slam against, say, the right wing, but is this idea that you could be a conservative Democrat or a liberal Republican, right? Something that is virtually vanished today. Right. Um, but for those who are more conservative thinkers, more hardliners with the war, he wanted to create this idea that a nuclear war was survivable. Okay? And he wrote a book in 1960, uh, wrote a series of lectures that he put together in a book that came out in 61 that was titled On Thermonuclear War. And it was an influential piece of public intellectual property. People were talking about it, um, not just politicians, but other public intellectuals. People might have a copy of it at home going over what it meant. It was a series of lectures with titles such as Will the Survivors Envy the Dead? And basically what a, another title which kind of confirmed his way of looking at things, something called Neither Oblivion Nor Surrender. Um, he had a series of figures, tables, illustrations, stories, all written in a very uh, free-flowing style. Evan Jones, who wrote the introduction to 2007 edition of On Thermonuclear War, called the book iconoclastic, interdisciplinary, calm, and reasonable. He brought rationality to the public nuclear debate. As a result, both sides were better able to avoid disaster during the Cold War both sides, of course, being the United States and the Soviet Union, right. the strategic concepts still apply. Strategic defense, local animosities, and the usual balance of power issues are still with us today. Critics at the time argued that the book was basically a how-to manual on how to conduct nuclear war. Um, but his idea of counterforce, counterforce plus what he called avoidance, avoiding nuclear situations, became policy for basically three decades. This guy's ideas influenced six presidential administrations. I mean, from Kennedy through Reagan. The Peace Catalog from 1984 argued that on thermonuclear war is still the best introduction to the, if we do this, they'll do that school of strategic analysis, <laughs> right. which is basically game theory, which I'll get to in a minute. But Evan Jones concludes his little introduction by saying the Cold War is over despite crises ranging from Berlin to Cuba. The West won a decisive victory without the use of a singular nuclear weapon on either side. But the nuclear genie is out of the bottle and the lessons and principles developed in on thermonuclear war apply as much to today's China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea as much as they did to the Soviets. Um, 
this book was filled with introductory into interdisciplinary information and it was exhaustive in its breadth and depth various sections on the specific effects of radioactive material for example uh, genetic consequences insurance rates of certain parts of the united states possible targets scenarios i remember being told once by i want to say it was one of my third grade teachers living in San Antonio, we wouldn't have to worry about surviving the nuclear war because San Antonio would be wiped be, off the map <laughs> because like we had four, <laughs> four Air Force bases, a Marine camp, and a um, and Army base, Fort, yeah. Fort, Fort Houston. Sam Houston, the, the one of the medical hubs of the, the U.S. Army branch. But overall, Khan used game theory in speculating that a nuclear war was not only winnable, but survival. And game theory consists basically of mathematical models based on rational agents. That is, optimizing results to parties working to a specific end given known facts and information, the logical decision-making process. So they would have a big table where one side would play the United States, one side would play the Soviet Union. Let's do a first strike here and see what happens. How would you guys respond? We'd respond with this. And they would work through the different scenarios. So he used in these essays, which I'm not gonna read anything from them. And here's a picture of him, by the way, just so you can get visual sense of the man. You wanna describe him for the folks? Oh, rotund looks a bit like um, Churchill. <laughs> he's 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 pretty pear shaped. He's Mister yeah. Five by Five. He's a right. large dude, um, <laughs> but he used his his. He had this appearance. I mean, you watch videos of him. He's he's unassuming yet confident. He really is fun to watch talk, but he used dark humor to make his points. What uh, there's a great book I read for this many years ago uh, called The Worlds of Herman Kahn by uh, Sharon and Sharon, I apologize, Gamari Tabrizi wrote a book called The Worlds of Herman Kahn. And she makes a real great argument that the sick humor and the dark humor of, of that was just coming to the forefront in the 1960s was one of the reasons that Kahn was so appealing a public intellectual. Sick humor as devised by someone, say, Lenny Bruce. <laughs> okay. But at the same time, there was also this development, and this is something that uh, last podcast on the left uh, with uh, Ben and Henry and, and Marcus uh, Parks talk about when they cover uh, Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield, the man who was the basis for Texas Hamlet, Chainsaw Hamlet Massacre and Psycho. Right. Yeah, and Psycho. And this guy who basically made furniture and implements for his house out of people's skin. Mm. Uh, and, and Dan Cummins from Time Suck did a great episode on him, too. This dark humor that prevailed, for example, when Ed Gein was doing his business in the 50s in Wisconsin, uh, one of the sick humor jokes that, that Dan Cummins recited was uh, something like, why doesn't Ed Gein's house have air conditioning so his furniture doesn't get goose pimples, <laughs> right? Just this idea of sick, dark humor that we can't quite, that we can't quite accept as appropriate but it gets a point across. And of course, one of my favorite jokes is, and I've told this to you many times, the joke about the serial killer and his victim walking through the woods and the victim says, these woods are scary. And uh, the serial killer says, why don't you think of me for a change? I'd have to walk back through these woods alone, right? <laughs> um, or even, even Gilbert Gottfried's 9-11 joke that he made in the famous roast scene that I'm sure you've seen online where he attended a roast right after 9-11 and his opening joke was, sorry, I'm late. My plane had an unexpected stop at the Empire State Building. <laughs> and the entire crowd booed him and then he launches into his version of the Aristocrats. This scene is featured in the Aristocrats documentary, the late Gilbert Godfrey. Mm -hmm. But sick humor was seen in Lenny Bruce, Mad Magazine, public currency at the time. And I had a, a teacher in middle school, which would have been during the Cold War, who said that that kind of humor and strangely enough, you and I were talking about the Challenger explosion before we started recording. He asked us when in history class, because we were talking about the importance of that date and if we would remember it, which we all would, of course, he said, are you hearing any sick jokes about it? And people were uncomfortable. Going, yeah, I'm hearing this one. And he goes, sick jokes are a sign of healing, that you're learning to deal with a tragedy you've just witnessed. Right. And what greater tragedy than annihilation by nuclear fire, right? And that's what Herman Kahn was dealing with. He was, in fact, at the time, considering making a serious film about nuclear war. He wanted to make a really in-depth movie about the effects of nuclear war. He had lunch with a young film director, and the topic was mainly of what we just discussed, this idea of sick humor and how does it play into nuclear war. And uh, another term that uh, uh, Garmari Tabrizi uses is the comedy of the unspeakable. How do we 
discuss something as horrific as the end of civilization without having dark humor in there somewhere. Um, similar to the way that doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals have to develop a thick skin through, through dark, dark humor. That young film director went on to make a movie and that movie was Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. That was Stanley Kubrick. And Dr. Strangelove himself, not the physical characteristics, but Dr. Strangelove was based in part on Herman Kahn and his oh, other wow. Rand associates. There's a character in Fel Failsafe who was based, uh, Sidney, Sidney Lumet's movie, is based on, on, on Herman Kahn, appears in Failsafe apparently. And to tie it back to one of the things we were talking about earlier, War Games, the film War Games, it came out in 83, I think, mm -hmm. um, about a young man who hacks into the NORAD Defense Center and accidentally almost starts a nuclear war. Matthew Broderick, Ali Sheedy, and a host of great 80s actors like Dabney Coleman and Barry Corbin and, and even Michael Madsen and John Spencer in that film, believe it or not. Now, the character of Falcon is reportedly based on Stephen Hawking. But the character of, of Falcon is, is the guy that programs this computer to realize that nuclear war is an unwinnable game. Right. And, and, and it, War Games serves as kind of a response to, I think, this wave of thinking that it is survival because it is not winnable or survival the way they play it out in the film. And then there's another, uh, there's an album by... Roger Waters mines similar territory, an album called Radio Chaos, which has similar themes to it. So we grew up in all that milieu, this fighting between mutually served destruction and this idea of the winnable nuclear war through preparation, through uh, privatized shelters, which actually, according to McKinney <clears throat> in a, a book I read a long time back, this idea of the private bomb shelter was it was a fantasy. Not as many people were building bomb shelters historically we thought. Mm -hmm. More people were relying on civil defense shelters. And it is interesting in, in a period of time where the country was pushing people to be, to be individuals and take responsibility for what happened in nuclear war, build your bomb shelters. More people still went to civil defense shelters for, for what they would perceive as a way to survive a nuclear war. A couple of final thoughts on this. Um, Khan died right after the Reagan administration announced the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, known as the Star Wars Defense. Right. He loved it. He thought it was a great idea because it was inventive. It thought outside conventional means. He loved this idea of the SDI, being able to shoot missiles down before they even get to their targets. And recently, just July 12th, I believe, have you heard about the New, New York City's new PSA for surviving a nuclear attack that just yes. aired. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I, you know, they, they aired it and everyone freaked out. And it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But this PSA is doing what? It is adhering to Khan's perception of this nuclear war being survivable. What to do in the case of a nuclear attack? In New York City? Really? Mm -hmm. Right. Go, go inside, take your clothes off because they've been contaminated, put them in a bag, throw them away. It's very calm. It's very logical. It's very rational, and it also seems, from my perspective, kind of silly. I mean, you're in the most populated city in the United States. Right. But there it is, right? There's this PSA that is reaffirming this guy's perspective that was, what, uh, 39, 61 years ago, right? I mean, that's been this dominant policy, and here it pops up once again in a PSA from July 12th. Um. So in that respect, I think Herman Kahn, originally my thesis that I posted, what he's probably the most influential thinker in terms of nuclear policy, I, I could be right. Uh, his ideas right, right. are still here. They're still very much prevalent. And as Evan Jones points out in that introduction, we're still dealing with different countries who have these policies. Right, absolutely. Okay, well, I just think that, that Kahn's legacy is still with us. Uh, as evidenced by the PSA and the way we are talking about current nuclear threats due to the the, the Russian invasion of, of, of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Um, sources for this piece, Herman Kahn's On Thermonuclear War from 1960, Evan Jones from the introduction to the 2007 edition of that book, 
Freeman Dyson's Disturbing the Universe from 79, Sharon Gamari Tabrizi's The Worlds of Herman Kahn from 2005, Wikipedia, uh, Mental Floss, 15 Surprising Facts About War Games by a guy named Matthew Jackson, um, Nuclear Preparedness PSA from New York City is Emergency Management, and that was on cbsnews.com from July 12th, and three YouTube videos, Herman Kahn's Towards Tomorrow, Utopia BBC documentary, The Centenary of Herman Kahn from the Hudson Institute, and then another video called Mutually Assured Destruction with Herman Kahn from something called The Power Principle. Hmm. And then notes and ideas from my own uh, dissertation from several years ago. <laughs> so that, that's Herman Kahn in a nutshell. This idea, who, this guy who said, there's not one future, there's multiple futures. And depending on what strategic point paths we take, we will get to certain futures in a certain way, given nuclear war. Right. Um, that's the kind of stuff, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night, just thinking about guys <laughs> right like on. Herman Kahn. And ultimately, I don't know how to feel about him. I mean, I think he's inter- an entertaining read. He's clearly super intelligent, but it's, it's you know, could he also be full of shit? Yeah, probably. I mean, I All just, right. I, I can't wrap my mind around, I keep coming back to the title of his one essay, uh, Will the Survivors Envy the Dead? And my answer is yes. I think in a nuclear situation they will. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, my first thought was, you know, if if you know if the alarms go off right now and you know there there are missiles coming in, I don't I don't want to live. Um, you know, I'm like, I mean, how long after a Holocaust will you know will podcasters be needed? <laughs> 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 I mean, a thousand years? I mean, so that's yeah, you know, that's you know, I'm I'm sort of fine with that. Um, I wonder what Khan would think of um, SDI now. I mean, because I because I think you said he died in eighty three. Eighty three, yeah. Okay. Um, so I mean, it turns out that SDI was a was a complete mirage. SDI didn't actually exist. They wanted it to exist, and they and they manufactured it and oversold it in order to make Gorbachev come to the table and, and negotiate start treaties and 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 the whole you know we have to build up in order to build down bullshit that that Reagan put forth. Yep um it's you know interesting that this, this is your topic because I, I was i was strangely considering talk, talking about something that's a little bit adjacent um because I, I i stumbled across a talk ted talk from uh, malcolm gladwell talking about uh the norton is a norton aiming device there, there there's um there's a device that was manufactured in the 30s by Mm -hmm. an american scientist who was a devout christian and the aiming on this on this bombing uh, on this device was was placed on on bombs and he really liked it because it it allegedly would allow bombers to have a higher level of precision and so therefore innocent people wouldn't be killed and um you know american forces you know told told those on those planes that you had to defend this this device and this device itself not the plane just the device not the bombs just the device you had to you know had to defend this because this this device can't fall into the hands of the germans well norton had already given it the germans beforehand so germany had the exact same <laughs> aiming device and it, it turns out it was not very precise it only hit you know, only only hit targets 10 percent of the time there was some famous bombing raid they went on where they were they were attacking some big manufacturing facility and they basically missed it because this device was not very accurate um and the same aiming device was used on the enola gay over hiroshima um and it missed its target by like a thousand feet but when you're dropping a bomb that's that big it doesn't really matter um, but no one told Norton while he was alive that it was used because he would be devastated because, of course, 125,000 people died in Hiroshima, I think. I don't know the numbers yeah, off the top I mean, of my head. Stat, right. So you know, indiscriminate killing. but Yeah. And and do we reach a point? I think we. This the answer is obviously yes. But where our technology out, outpaces our moral understanding clearly that happens all the time in history right right right. right? and and do we really need this you know kind of device comes up when we read stories like this and i don't know you said that what what would herman khan think of the norton is is that was that your question think think of um i mean he was alive during that but, but you know so if he was an advocate for or like the fact that sdi was being you know, postulated or, re- or being worked on did he find out during his lifetime that it turns out it was all 
a mirage. It didn't. I mean, he, they were. I don't think he did because he died in '83, and it was like right. right after, right after they announced. I think. Right. So, so that idea in in theory was great, but it was. It turns out it was horseshit. Right. I think he would love the idea of a space force. <laughs> uh, seriously, I think he would. I think he would love the idea of a space force. And, and you um, and I, we're, um, we're, we're going to enlist, right? I'm, I'm going to join the space force. <laughs> you go <Come> first. <laughs> okay. be, be weightless. So Fart, I, I, farting in space. <laughs> Plat farting in space. Did you see what the commander was wearing? What kind of <laughs> what kind of zero G suit is that? Um, so as I said, I, I might look at some other futurists, specifically Freeman Dyson, who I mentioned in this piece. And I also might look at a guy by the name of Buckminster Fuller, oh, yeah. just to get a sense of what futurism uh, can really hold. And, and I think like the worlds of Herman Kahn, there are you know, many views of the future and Herman Kahn's was just one of them, but it was certainly a predominant one and one that uh, still affects us today. So there he is, Herman Kahn. Nice. This week on Dream, on Dream Idiots, we're, I mean, we're not, not actually that idiotic. That was, you know, that, this was actually, dare I say, almost cerebral? No. <laughs> yes, but, you know, we saved, we saved ourselves from that fate by having clat fart in there. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, only, uh, you only come off as, you know, smart and articulate one in 10 episodes. And that's, that's about the, the, right, the right. Brian, answer. Brian, there, but for the grace of clat fart, go I. <laughs> All right, we're done for another one, folks. Thanks for listening. Please rate and subscribe and share and do all those good things for us and let us know what you think. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week.